Wonderful to see such a big crowd. We really didn't anticipate it. We're very glad that you are here. We're starting off the program tonight with Bagpipe and Flags Entrance by Hans Thompson, Pat Sullivan, and Mochi Barrington. So when you're ready, fellas, take it away. Thank you very much. They are both Shamrock Club members. And we appreciate everybody that's participating in this program. I have to say this show is bittersweet because, as you know, our MC for many years and my dear friend Judy McDaniel left this life about a month ago. I was asked to line up the program for this year, and I've got to tell you, Judy left such a legacy that it's a little bit difficult. It's not easy. So um, the Shamrock Club wanted to dedicate a program to her, but it's not going to be tonight. We're mentioning Judy tonight, but we will have a program in her honor where we can have information about her life the people that she knew from New London, and some of the fun things that she did. Actually, I feel a wee bit jittery up here without Judy, and I just wondered if perhaps her brother Fluff could uh, join me. Many of you noticed him perhaps out at the bar, and although he is up in heaven in reality with his sister Judy, he, he popped in tonight. So. I would just love to have him here, Hi Fluff. Uh oh. Well. So thank you very much. I think that that will help me calm my nerves. Now I'm going to call on Mochi to ha say something special. Shamrock Club members and the family had to get together. We have a cross for Fluff. Cross. Last, uh, our 2,000 men, Irishmen of the year, last for Fluff. Fluff. 
it's good to honor those who have gone before us in whatever way we have fun with. Um, anyway, before Judy McDaniel was MC of the program, Jerry Murphy was in charge. And Jerry, who started the whole idea of this Irish show and um, to have stories and music, he always started his show like this. Oh, they sprinkled it with stardust just to make its lake so grand. And when they had it finished, sure they called it Ireland. I was fortunate to have my first trip to Ireland just a few years ago with a special group of five friends. Uh, three of them are here tonight. They are like family. The group included Judy and her daughter, Leah. Where are you, Leah? Can you wave? There she is. Um, myself and my daughter, Makushla. Uh, Makushla just had a baby, and she's in the hospital. So we're very thrilled about that. And Randy. Poor Randy with four women to haul around in our rented car. <laughs> he had his hands full, let me tell you. Maneuvering through roundabouts while driving on the wrong side of the road. That could rattle anyone's nerves, right, Randy? But we were always Johnny on the spot to tell him what he did wrong and <laughs> tell him how to fix it. So we started our journey around Ireland. Many times on our trip, the words of the Irish songs that I have known and sung all my life came back to my mind. And while when you're in Ireland in person, it's, it's better than all the poems and stories that you've read all your life. It truly is. And I was especially reminded of a song that I learned from Jerry Murphy. So I'm going to sing that for you now. You know, the Americans, we want to buy things if we can. We think sometimes that's the answer, but not always. An American landed on Aaron's Green Isle. He gazed at Killarney with rapturous smile. How can I buy it, he said to his guide. I'll tell you how, with a smile he replied. How can you buy all the stars in the sky? How can you buy two blue Irish eyes? How can you purchase a fond mother's sighs? How can you buy Kilmarney? Nature bestowed all her gifts with a smile. The emerald, the shamrock, the blarney. When you can buy all these wonderful things, then you can buy Killarney. Such a wonderful landscape you never have seen. A jewel so rare will befit any queen. Pride of old Aaron, a joy to behold. Heaven on earth, far more precious than gold. How can you buy all the stars in the sky? How can you buy two blue Irish eyes? How can you purchase a fond mother's sighs? How can you buy Killarney? Nature bestowed all her gifts with a smile. The emerald, the shamrock, the blarney. When you can buy all these wonderful things, then you can buy Killarney. When you can buy all these wonderful things, 
then you can buy Killarney. Thank you very much. Before we introduce the Parade Royalty, I'd like to invite our newest musical trio to the stage. Pat and Angela Nearing have been members of the Shamrock Club for a long time. But who knew they were musicians? Actually, it took some convincing, but Pat managed to talk Angela and their son into to learning an Irish tune for tonight's program. So. Pat is going to play trombone, Angela flute, and John trumpet. So they'll be coming right up here to play the parting glass. excited to hear this uh, family arrangement and I think it's about time to start. <laughs> to learn to play the flute just for this program. And wow, that's pretty darn good. Thank you. Uh, now's a good time just to thank Steve Malliott back there on the camera. He's recording our show tonight. Our new city videographer is named Casey Pingle. 
and he's letting Steve use the city's camera on it. He's going to put the program on the city's TV channel. Have any of you noticed the program that he's produced and called The End of the Rainbow? Really appreciate him just coming to New London and trying to see what's going on. He did a really neat program on the fishing shanties. I think he had Ted Christian and some other fisher people on that program. You don't have to have cable to watch these shows. So just so that you know, uh, you can log onto the city website on your phone or your computer. And you can um, watch it. Just go to the city website and look for YouTube. Thank you, Casey. We loved Dick Johnson for all the years and the work that he did over the years. And his films are stored right down at the city. And they'll be shown from time to time. Now it's my pleasure to ask the daughter and great granddaughter of our parade, Grand Marshal, to come up. Dorothy Nielsen is a fine community representative to be our Grand Marshal for two years. As they are, as you were coming up, I was thinking how lucky you were to be the Grand Marshal for two years. You know, I was down at TV Pliance the other day, and I asked Dorothy, what do you call an Irishman who keeps bouncing off the walls? And I said, I don't know. What do you call an Irishman who keeps bouncing off the walls? She told me, Rick O'Shea. <laughs> Barb Newman is, Barb, is Dorothy's daughter, and I'll turn the mic over to her now. Thank you, Melissa. I'm very pleased to be here. My brother is here as well, and some of our family. And we're pleased to be able to support and celebrate a very special lady. In fact, one of In fact, one of um, Dorothy's great granddaughters has written an introduction, a short introduction, and she'd like to read it for you now. So this is Isabel Wendland. Hello, my name is Isabel Wetland, and I am here to introduce the Grand Marshal for the St. Patrick event. Her name is Dorothy Nielsen, and she is my great-grandma. Grandma Dorothy has watched the parade from the store windows of TV Pliance since the very first year. Since then, TV Pliance has been the gathering place for our family and friends to come down, eat snacks, and watch the parade. I do not think my grandma Dorothy is Irish, but she makes great cookies and plays yard darts with me. She's 95 years old, so she knows more than most people. And, <laughs> and she gets her hair done every Friday. I am lucky to have her as a great grandma, and London is lucky to have her as a grand marshal. Please give a round of applause for Grandma Dorothy. thinking about coming here, what a beautiful day it would have been 
to have a St. Patrick's oh. Day parade. But we'll wait for another year. We are patient. You can tell that by the way we've acted this last year. Thank you very, very much. several gifts to, pre to present to you, Dorothy, and just signs of our admiration for you and your worth to our entire community. Uh, Susie Snyder's holding up a plaque that you can hang in your wall, and Cora Hunchke is going to present the gift to you. Thank you, Dorothy. Hopefully we'll have the parade next year and you can ride through the parade. <laughs> next, I'd like to introduce our Irish lad and lass, who are lucky enough to have also hold that title, held that title for two years. So, uh, if they would like to come up, please welcome Jasmine Villalobos, and she is the daughter of Melissa Bilo. Here she comes, and Jake Flocker, the son of Leslie and Rick. So we have gifts for you, both of you, but first, let's hear you read the wonderful poems that you wrote. I want to say first that the way to become the lad and lassie is to enter the annual poetry contest, which you did last year. And let me tell you, when we pick up the entries, we have a really big pile to read through, sometimes like that. And the poems are, are good. We have a committee. Uh, usually reading is Colleen Kelly, Debbie Nye, myself, and Judy McDaniel. So next year we will need to find a new reader to join us and have fun. Our criteria is that the poem has to hit on the theme for the year, which this year was It's a Magical Place, New Dublin. And both of you wrote a great poem. Should we go ladies first? I feel the slow air rushing past my hair. I can see colorful candy being tossed into the air. Visions of rainbows, leprechauns, pots of gold, tons of people waiting, young and old. Tis a magical place, New Dublin. I hear clapping when everyone walks by. I smell the cotton candy being handed out by a friendly guy. Balloons, toys, necklaces, pops of green, tales of leprechauns never to be seen. Tis a magical place, New Dublin. Rainbows of many colors, all so bright. St. Patrick's Day has love, what a beautiful sight. Dancing, music, people who sing. During this parade, you'll feel like a king. Tis a magical place, New Dublin. And now I would like Jake Flocker to read his poem. Tis a magical place, New Dublin. Tis a magical place indeed. Walking around this town with all of my citizens with me. Looking high and low, looking near and far, those leprechauns sure are sneaky wherever they are. Tis a magical place, New Dublin. Tis a magical place indeed. The parade's in town and everyone's wearing green. Everyone has this cheer that you just can't have on your own, but when you get together with the crowd, with everyone that you know, Hopefully next time at the parade, you'll be able to see that this whole town of New Dublin is just one big family. Tis a magical place, New Dublin. Tis a magical place indeed. Walking around Irish proud with my whole family. One 
Isn't that wonderful? Um, we have Cora and Susie to present their plaques. And I'm going to call our club treasurer, Randy Schneider, to present a monetary award. And it's kind of interesting that these funds are donated by the O'Neill family every year. It's their appreciation that Ireland's literary history is continued in our show. Thank you, Randy. Ireland's love affair with writing, I've asked a few Shamrock Club members to read a short, well, to read a short story and, or a poem, whatever they would like to read, and they've practiced some reading, so. So I would like Cora to come up, please. Cora Hutchke is a Shamrock Club member, and she is going to read The Crock of Gold from the Leprechaun Tales book. I can't wait to hear this. The Crock of Gold. This is not a pot of gold, and you'll know why. It was a clear moonlit night as Tom walked home from the village. Suddenly he heard a most peculiar sound coming from the bushes ahead. His mother had warned him to ignore us any strange sounds that night as this was the fairy people. And, they, and if they appeared, look out. Even so, Tom paused for a moment because before moving closer to the bushes to see what was possibly be making that noise. He couldn't believe his eyes. There in front of him was a little man, no bigger than Tom's hand, with his beard tangled in the bush. He wore brown trousers, a green waistcoat, and a bright red cap on his head, and his tiny shoes were on the ground beside him. He had something in his hand, and when Tom looked at it closely, he saw that it was an awl the size of a thimble. This is my lucky day, Tom said. I have found a leprechaun, and every leprechaun has a pot of gold. I just have to keep him in sight, and the gold will be mine. Tom grabbed the leprechaun. He struggled, but Tom held him tightly and untangled his beard from, from the bush, and this just made him angry. But Tom ignored this bad temper, and he whistled a merry tune. All the while, he made sure that he kept a firm hold on the leprechaun. Put me down, shouted. Not until you tell me where you have hidden your crock of gold. At last, when the leprechaun realized that Tom was determined not to let him go, he said, right, I give up. The gold is buried under that bush over there. Now let me go. Oh, no, said Tom. I have no spade, and if I go home now, how will I remember which bush it is that with the gold under it? Well, the leprechaun thought, why not mark the bush with your handkerchief? Of course, said Tom, that's a good idea. But you must promise me that you won't take the gold when I'm gone. And the leprechaun promised, he promised, no that. So Tom put him down, and he set off for home. The dawn was breaking by then, by the time he returned. As he approached the bushes, what a sight met his eyes. Every bush had a bright red handkerchief tied to its lowest branch. What a fool I was to have let that leprechaun out of my sight, he whispered. Sadly to himself, the gold will never be mine now. Perhaps he imagined it, but as he slowly made his way home, Tom thought he could hear the sound of laughter 
blowing in the wind from you know who. That was darling. There's nothing like hearing a story, is there? Next, I want to invite club member Ryan Lanning up here to talk about Irish food. We will need the take. There you go. Oh, you guys are Johnny on the spot. You know, when I was down at TV Pliance, Dorothy asked me something about food. She, I, she said, "When is a potato not an Irish potato?" And I said, hmm, when is a potato not an Irish potato? And Dorothy told me, when it's a French fry. <laughs> it's fun to pick on you, Dorothy. Ryan, that looks beautiful. Did you bake that? Sure did. Yes, I, I did bake this. Um, well, since it's in my hands, we're talking about, let's talk about Irish soda bread. What we have here is Irish soda bread. It's Irish it's bread. That's all you need to know. No. Um, what Irish soda bread is, is it's basically a simple dough. You mix a couple ingredients, you bake. So what was in mine was, you sure can, was flour, baking powder, baking soda, salt, sugar, buttermilk, one egg, and raisins. That's all it is. And you mix it together, you form your dough, you knead it once or twice. You don't have to knead it like you used because it's not going to rise. You need to be gentle with it because it will fall apart. You, you, you put it on a straight sheet pan baker for about 50 minutes for 325, 350. You leave those nice golden brown. Just stick a toothpick in the middle, it should come out dry. That's your Irish shoulder bread. You can add raisins if you want. That's always optional if you don't like raisins. Um, the Irish shoulder bread is just one variation of of this type of soda bread. It was also popular in Britain as well, and there's all different variations that have baking powder, flour, and baking soda. The reason why, all those ingredients are cheap. You know, everybody in that era had these ingredients in their home so they could make this. It required little skill. There was no leveling, because there's no yeast in here, so you didn't have to prove it, like we do with our yeast, yeast bread, yeast stoves, and the baking was pretty simple. So anybody could make it, and it was easy to make. Boy, I, I wonder if I could have a piece after the show. I, I did bring recipes if you guys want some. I have a few. Oh, boy. Now, I'm going to hold this up for you because he's now going to talk about an Irish dinner. So, this time of year we're all familiar with corned beef, but I bet most of you don't know why it's called corned beef. Does anybody know? You do not. I think you're lying, man. Okay. No, really, does anybody know why it's called corned beef? Most people don't know, they just know it. it's corned beef, it's an Irish thing. They're supposed to eat it right now. Fine. It's called corned beef, and you'll never guess why, and it makes perfectly good sense. And I only know this because I went to school to be a chef, and after my meat identification class, one of my classmates thought it would be funny to try to stump our teacher. And he's a very bright individual when it comes to the culinary field. We thought we had him, and he told us why, and we realized we're not going to stump him. So. The way he explained it, the reason why this was corned beef is back um, in the early 1900s, or maybe even earlier, before they had modern refrigeration, the butcher had to cure most of our meats with salt because that kept the harmful bacteria from growing, multiplying, and it wouldn't harm us. So he took this inferior cut of meat, which could have been a flank steak or a brisket, that back in those days, the people with money didn't buy that because it was considered inferior. It took a long time to cook, wasn't very tender, it was fatty. You know, they weren't buying that. They were buying the more tender, excuse me, tender cuts of meat. So that butcher took this meat and he layered a grain of salt with like a kernel of corn in this oak barrel with this meat. And he stuck a sign in it and said, corned beef, and the nickname just stuck. The people that were buying it back then, as I explained before, were the poor people in society, which were a lot of the Irish people and others that knew that this didn't cost a lot of money. They were willing to eat it. You just had to slow cook it and you could feed your family. So corned beef. And of course, everybody has cabbage and potatoes and carrots. Those are readily available vegetables, so they go well with corned beef and cabbage. It looks wonderful, and is that available here at Crystal Falls? Yes, it, yes, it is. They are serving it tonight. <laughs> so, um, it's Friday. I have to eat fish, but maybe I could have a bite of it tomorrow. Yeah, yes. <laughs> okay. Ryan is a member of the Shamrock Club of New Dublin. He's a 
absolutely wonderful member who has taken over our publicity PR, and that's a big job. And also, uh, last year he joined the ranks of the uh, leprechaun, and so he helps change the city street signs and visits the old and the young while they're doing it. So thanks, Ryan. We have a special song and skit prepared that some of the children have worked out. Actually, we started it. Kids, you can come now. All four of you have to come up. We started it last year, so we had two years to get it straight. As the children are coming up, um, I guess uh, that, I want that over... Yeah, that'll be good. That'll be good. We have to arrange, you know, Mrs. Murphy's living room. But before we start the song, I will need my guitar. And I just want um, everyone to understand, you guys can come up. Um, we're not going to have this. Why don't you move this over there so it's not in your way. Thank you, honey. You know, years ago, people didn't have all the luxuries that we have in our kitchens today. We have... What do we have? Pot for making our, our soups, a stock pot. We have a Dutch oven for casseroles. We have egg poaching pans. We have, you name it, we have it, right? So um, even at Christmas time, you might get something that you really don't need, but you know, deep fryer, who needs that? But anyway, this is the kind of pot people had years ago. A great big pot, and they not only cooked all of their meals in it, but guess what? They also did the laundry. So this song is going to talk about Mrs. Murphy, since the Murphys are being honored here tonight, and the uh, unfortunate thing that happened during the party. So just a second, we'll start singing. Oh. 
more true and we're worn out at the knees. They have their many ups and downs as plainly we could see. When Mrs. Murphy, she came to, she starts to cry and pout. She had them in the wash that day and forgot to take them out. Jim Nolan, he excused himself for what he said that night. So we put music to the word and sang with all our might. Who threw the overalls in Mrs. Murphy's powder? Murphy, 
son of Harry and Bob. Matt is going to talk about his parents. Put some notes together for tonight. <laughs> Putting thought into uh, speaking about my parents for the uh, Irish Man and Irish Rose, um, I went to a book that I have on everything Irish, and I looked through all the poetry and songs, and one of them popped out to me that I thought I would share: "The Wild Rose." Does everybody know that song? No name, never no more. So the, the story of that song is a young lad who goes off and spends all of his money on whiskey and beauty. <laughs> brought some memories to me. <laughs> and then at the end of the story, he, he returns to his home, where he then asks, as the prodigal son, he asks his parents for a pardon. So while we were all together, I thought I would ask for that pardon. <laughs> now, <laughs> We're all very proud of my parents for being an Irish man and Irish rose. My father is a hundred percent Irish. In today's world, there's not a lot of people that are a hundred percent anything, so that's a very proud thing to be. Um, our family tree on that side, the Murphys, the Sullivans, the Lownies, the Hurleys, very Irish families, obviously a hundred percent. Grandpa Jim was the first Irishman, and he helped run the, start the parades, the first parade, the second parade, he was the first Irishman. Um, Melissa shared the video through Facebook this week, so it was fun to watch the 1984 parade with our family. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Mom and Dad are now the first two-time Irish man and <laughs> Irish rose. <laughs> Three feet. We got t-shirts that say three feet on. As you can tell, the Irish wit runs deep in our family. Grandpa always had a saying that I remember him saying at night, Grandpa Jim. Every time he left his house, he'd say, see you in the morning. And then my Uncle Tom, he, was, he lived up in Eau Claire. He always said, keep it in the pocket. We still don't know what all that means. <laughs> Dad will explain. My dad's got a lot of Irish wit. I'm sure everybody here has stories of his wit out and about. Uh, my Aunt Sue reminded me of a funny one this past week. Dad was a truck driver for many years. And one of his sayings was always how he stayed faithful to mom all those years as a truck driver. He parked in the puddle to keep the hookers away. <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep it clean as a family event. <laughs> My mother doesn't have a lot of Irish in her, but we know she was kissed by the Blaney Stone. Melissa said in the video, when you kiss the Blarney Stone, you get the gift of gab. So we know she's kissed the Blarney Stone. <laughs> they were both very active for many years in the Shamrock Club. Mom and her friend Sheila helped with the Lad and Lassie program for many years. Um, Mom and Margie Petit would always be seen setting up the parade lineup before the parades. Both of them volunteered at the tents, and both were parade judges in 2003. We're very deserving of this honor tonight. Um, as I wrote through this and thought through the meaning of St. Patrick's Day, um, in America especially, the, the meaning of St. Patrick's Day here in America is to show Irish unity, our heritage, celebrate our heritage, and, and have family gatherings to draw us all together. So thanks for putting this on tonight. It means a lot to our family.
I have, uh, oh, who do we have going through here now? <laughs> oh, more Murphys. I would like to ask Terry if she will read a letter from an Irish mother. I will. When I worked at St. Joseph Residence, I was a manager at the Marion Heights Apartments and I had all lovely tenants. This one particular one, 30 years ago, was from England and she married um, a New London soldier boy and came back to New London and raised her family. And so about 30 years ago, she gave me a copy of this letter. I plastered it all over Marion Heights, St. Joe's, and it was always on my office door every St. Patrick's Day. And I've had an awful lot of fun with it. The first person I read it to was my mom and dad up in their apartments, and we laughed so hard we were literally crying. So I hope that you enjoy this. We should have some jokes tonight. So this is a letter from an Irish mother. Dear son, just a few lines to let you know I'm still alive. I'm writing this letter slowly because I know you can't read fast. You won't know the house when you get home. We've moved. <laughs> About your father, he has a lovely new job. He has 500 men under him. He cuts grass at the cemetery. <laughs> there was a washing machine at the new house when we moved in, but it hasn't been working too good. Last week I put in 14 shirts, pulled the chain and haven't seen them since. <laughs> Your sister Mary had a baby this morning, but I haven't found out whether it's a boy or a girl, so I don't know if you're an aunt or an uncle. <laughs> and your Uncle Patrick drowned last week in a vat of whiskey in the Dublin Brewery. Some of his workmates tried to save him, but he fought them off bravely. <laughs> they cremated him, and it took three days to put out the fire. <laughs> I went to the doctor on Thursday, <laughs> and, and your father went with me. The doctor put a small tube in my mouth and told me not to talk for 10 minutes. Your father offered to buy it from him. <laughs> it only rained twice this week, first for three days and then for four days. Monday was so windy, one of the chickens it laid the same egg four times. We had a letter from the undertaker. He said it was the last payment on your grandmother's plot, and if it wasn't paid in seven days, up she comes. Love your mother. P.S. I was going to send you $10 but I already sealed the envelope. <laughs> I really put that in the letter to Matt Murphy once. <laughs> After I asked and he was in school, I wrote that at the bottom. <laughs> that was delightful, Carol. Thank you. And I just want to thank the Shamrock Club for everything and everything that they do for New London. I appreciate this last year and this year. And, um, but I just know where all the donations that, and all the money you raise goes back to this community and to our high school graduates and to our, they start at Little League and all the way through high school and we are blessed to have them in town. So always support your Shamrock Club guys. <laughs> Thank you very much. I would now like to ask Bob, the Irishman of last year and this year, to say a few words. You know, we had to have the program tonight because well, Dorothy and, and Bob and Terry would have had to wait three years, so we thought we better have an, a night to honor them. Yes, and that's why we've talked about three, and the t-shirt's already bought. It's creepy, if anybody cares. But I'd like to thank the Shamrock Club, and it's good to see younger people in it. I'm so glad to see our table full of people here, and brothers and sisters that showed up, and friends, family. Uh, it goes back to 2019, I'm watching a Monday night football game, and the phone rings, 
and it says Tom Barrington on the caller ID. And I answered the phone and he says, uh, Bob, this is a, well, he said it was Moochie. You have to tell you what know Tom, it's Moochie. That's, that's his name if you didn't know it. <laughs> and uh, he said, I want, Judy wants to talk to you. Well, Judy is his wife. And I thought, what, what does Judy want? <laughs> well, it was Judy McDaniels. And we're all thinking of her tonight. And uh, she interviewed us last year. It was such a, anyway, she said, Bob, are you and Terry going to Florida next year? Yeah, and I think, does she want to go to Florida with us? <laughs> what the heck is this about? But then they invited us to be uh, Irish man, Irish year. It's hard to believe it's uh, 18 months ago. And uh, we're very honored. The Murphy family, dad was number one in 84, Uncle Gerald. Dick and Don Cousins, now Bob Murphy, and Uncle Warren. We have six on the list, so that just tells you the good taste the Irish machine he had, she rocks up at. So I would just like to say thank you to all, and thanks for coming tonight. And Matthew, thanks for your nice talk. tell me that I'm not that I'm not very tall <laughs> these are the gifts that we are giving to Bob and Terry the plaques and gifts we would like the Irish Rose and Man to stay up here you're not finished yet <laughs> okay now uh, we have a surprise act for you so actually, there are two direct and indirect family members of the Irish Man and Rose, Terry's sister, Pam Clone, and someone's brother-in-law, Brian Kling. They told me so many family names that I couldn't keep it straight, but we want Brian and Pam to come up now.
because I couldn't remember who his family or who. Son-in-law, you really are. Badgers, North Carolina, the finals. 
five to sixty-two. The Badgers won by twenty-three points. <laughs> Next, I would like to call to the stage Joan Malliott. Joan is a longtime member of the Shamrock Club and a sister of Julie McDaniel and Mucha and Fluff. Judy McDaniel loved to attend the New London High School Awards Ceremony. Now, listen up, folks. Okay. Judy McDaniel loved to attend the high school awards ceremony and present the scholarships from the Shamrock Club. This year we were able to include a special scholarship from the Jim and Elaine Mulhern family. And Joan, I'll let you talk about the scholarships. All right, um, actually we have two years full of, of scholarship winners that we need to announce because unfortunately our um, recipients from the class of 2019 didn't get their chance to, uh, to um, be in the parade and to get their recognition. So in 2019, the class of 2019 scholarship recipients were Lindsay Standerfer, Noah Schiedermeyer, and Trisha Lidke. Now the 2020 class um, is a little bit special to someone like me and was very important to Judy because she knew a lot of these kids from a long time ago, especially one of them. Um, the recipient, one recipient of the Shamrock Cup Scholarship from the class of 2020 was Sydney Ruckdashel. Sydney is a daughter of John and Stacy Ruckdashel, and she's attending UW Stevens Point. The second recipient was Megan Besaw, daughter of Corey and Deanna Besaw, and she's attending UW Oshkosh. The third recipient, the one that she was going to get a kiss from up on the stage when she presented that scholarship, is Ben Malliott. And Ben is the son of Stephen Joan Malliott, and he is attending UW Lacrosse. So we all have a little special feeling about that one. This year we also um, were able to give out the Jim, Law, Jim and Elaine Lawhorn Memorial Scholarship, and the recipient was Spencer Falks. Spencer's the son of Dave and Thomasina Folks, and Spencer is attending UW Green Bay. So all of you people that are out there that are in this senior class this year, and there are a few of them with us tonight, we are kind of hoping we can announce you guys next year, and we can have a great big group of kids up on that float. So thank you. I think it's nice to know where some of the money from the Shamrock Club goes, and that's a, a good good place for it. So keeping uh, on the literary side of the Irish in our show, I'd like Bill Fleece to step up and read an Irish poem. Um, before he gets here, I wanted to tell you that <laughs> he's already here. Maybe come back up. I like standing by you, Bill. Okay, so um, I was talking to Bob Murphy the other day, and he asked me, what do you call a fake rock in Ireland? And I said, hmm, I thought, what do they call a fake rock in Ireland? And Bob told me, a sham rock. <laughs> Bill is one of the oldest members and also founder of the restaurant we are working, we are meeting in this evening. Thank you, Bill. And Bill's poem will be read now. I hope all of you are as interested in the literary side of the Irish people as we are in our club. Uh, many years we have had the Irish dancers, and of course that makes for a colorful evening, and we hope we can have them another year. But this year it just wouldn't work for us. So we're going with more poetry. I found a four-leaf clover and was happy with my find. But with time to think it over, I've entirely changed my mind. I concealed it in my pocket, safe inside a paper pad, 
soon, much swifter, swifter than a rocket, my good fortune turned to bad. I smashed my fingers in a door. I dropped a dozen eggs. I slipped and tumbled to the floor. A dog nipped both my legs. My ring slipped down the bathtub drain. My pen leaked on my shirt. I barked my shin. I missed my train. I sat on my dessert. <laughs> I broke my brand new glasses. I couldn't find my keys. I stepped and spilled molasses and was stung by angry bees. When the kitten ripped the curtain and the toast burst into flames, I was absolutely, absolutely certain that the clover was to blame. I buried it discreetly in the middle of the field. Now my luck was changed completely and my wounds have almost healed. If I ever find another, I will simply let it be or I'll give it to Bob and Terry. They deserve it more than me. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. You know, that really was having a bad day. Uh, we have one more poem called Irish Treasure that Cora is going to read. <laughs> Irish Treasure. Somewhere over the rainbow lies a lovely emerald isle, a place that seems to beckon folks to come and stay a while. Once you've had a taste of it, you want to keep going back for the Irish can provide you with any treasure you lack. A one pot of gold is their friendship. They are full of goodwill and charms. Always a smile and a cheery hello as they welcome you with open arms. Some of their treasure is scenery, the hills, the dales, the moors, winding brooks and rivers, and double as famous bright colored doors. Laughter is a national treasure. So the twinkle in their so is the twinkle in their eye. When they start with this is a true story, you know it will be a lie. They laugh at their own sense of humor and it's absolutely contagious. Some of the stories they've had us believe are totally outrageous. I'll go back to the end of that rainbow, for there's lots I've not yet seen. God knew what he was doing when he painted our island green. Very nice, Cora and Bill. Thank you very much. My next performer is Emily Hobbs. You met her earliest this evening as Mrs. Murphy of the infamous Chowder. While she's coming up, I wanted to talk about the parade judges. And I'll need my guitar for this one. Every year, the club chooses two parade judges whose duty it is to watch the parade as the units go by and carefully choose their favorites. Of course, we didn't need them last year, and we don't need them this year either. But we already asked them, so we have to honor them with their gift and a thank you for the service not done. <laughs> the judges are Teresa Hamilton, Bob Murphy's sister, and Sheila Wilson, early member of the Shamrock Club. We have their plaques, but neither of them, Teresa's not here either, is she? No. No. So they're both, um, they have family obligations and they didn't want to run into any COVID problems. So everyone was supposed to wear their mask tonight. So Susie and, and Cora can present their plaques another time. It is my pleasure to have worked with M.B. Hobbs for three of our recent Irish programs. She has a delightful voice and she's fun to practice with. This year, M.B.'s song is Wild Mountain Time. We would love to have the audience sing along with us on the refrain.